Welcome to Race Talks. My name is Marcy Benny, and I am your host for this evening. I am going to tell you a little bit about how the evening's going to run and about myself in a bit. But first, I'd like to invite you to look up at the screen, and we are going to show our newcomers orientation video with our founder and director, Donna Maxey. I'm Donna Maxey. I am the founder director of Race Talks, and we're really excited to see you here. I just wanted to do quite, kind of an introduction about what Race Talks is about. We're doing this for newcomers. Race Talks was started out of um, when I was asked to speak at a McMenamin's History Pub, and the topic was urban renewal, urban removal. If you turn to the other side of the brochure, there is um, we have rules. We have the race talks ground rules. Try to encourage people to follow these rules. And they're important that people feel safe being here. I've had people of color who have said, this is the first time I've ever told a white person how I really feel. And I've had white people who have said, this is the first time that I was able to talk about race and not worry about putting my foot in my mouth. I feel safe to talk, I feel safe that I will be accepted and I won't be beat up for, for saying or asking what seems like an obvious and stupid question. So that's really important. So what we encourage people to do is to listen to each other with curiosity, respect differences, agree to disagree. You don't have to agree with everything somebody says. You can agree that that's their opinion. Speak from the self and, not, and, and from the heart. It means when you're speaking, don't talk about, I know somebody who, either it's you and you were involved with the person or, you know, speak from your own experience, not someone else's. Respect confidentiality. Now, because you're involved in these discussions, you have a right to go out and share the discussion that happened at your table. But what we're asking you to do is if you do share something that someone else has said, to not give their name, to not give their location. Contribute honestly and positively. That's all we can ask anybody to do. And assume positive intent. Even if somebody says something and you, and you feel like you want to roll your eyes and say, how could you be so stupid? Assume that they, they really had best intentions when they, did, when they said what they said. Be open to new ideas and relax and enjoy. Those, the follow-up activities, these are the things that we're trying to get people to do. One of the things that folks do a lot of times is they'll go to a lecture and they'll feel so good about the lecture and then they go home and do the same things they've always done. And what we want folks to do is something different. Don't go home to your community where you don't know people of color or you don't know white people. Go home and get to, you know, get to know the people who are at your table. We have little cards, little colored cards at the table for those folks who say, well, I don't have a business card, so give people your number. Get together, have coffee. <clears throat> and it says, go out for, uh, just for fun, go out and make friends with a person in your own ethnic group. I moved to an area in Portland that I had taught in, and there were kids of color, lots of kids of color at my school, so I just assumed there would be lots of people in the neighborhood who were of color, and boy, was I wrong. After I'd been there a year, I got a couple of the neighbors that were friendly to help me throw one of those uh, block parties. So we threw one of those, we passed out flyers, four blocks wide, 10 blocks long, and about 50 people came. And what amazed me is that some of those people had lived in that neighborhood for 28 years and didn't know each other. So what I'm inviting people to do is go make friends with someone in your own ethnic group. Let me ask a question. How many of you know the people on your block, three houses to your left, the three houses to your right, and three in front of you? Now, if you know nine houses, and when I say no, meaning you know them, you've been in their house, you got their phone number, how many people know that? Look around the room. So get to know your neighbors. Talk to the people who are around you. And when you do, don't discuss race. If, you, if it's a person of color, or if you're a person of color, it's a white person, don't talk about race, just talk about what you have in common, you know? Things like, gee, that's a nice shirt you have on, or 
You just never know what, where it's going to lead in the discussion. You never know what you'll find out from people when you talk to them. You might develop a relationship from it. So, um, and the question is, how many people of color, if you are white, and how many white people and people of other ethnicities are on your speed dial? Now, what I call speed dial is those are your people that you call up and say, hey, I just got a promotion, let's go have a drink. Hey, me and the boyfriend broke up, need to talk. You know, those people you call at three o'clock in the morning. You say, who can I call and talk to? How many people from different ethnic groups are on your speed dial? And if they're not, the question is why not? There are a couple of premises that we have here at Race Talks, and there's a great book that I'd love for you to read. It's called Courageous Conversations in Race. It is a part of the foundation that I used in helping to put together Race Talks. And one of the things that they talk about in Courageous Conversations in Race is that we make the assumption, we do talk about race and white is a race, and we make the assumption that white people have privilege. And a lot of white people would say, I don't have privilege, I work my butt off. Well, yes, you do work your butt off. But what you don't know is that people of color work hard, and they have to. And, um, and to help you kind of understand that, Think of yourself as a fish. You wouldn't ask a fish, how's the water? Fish don't even know they're in water. Just like white people don't know that they have privilege. But I'm a fish too. But somebody threw me on the dock. And every so often I get to jump in the water. When I get a degree or I get a promotion or something great happens, I get to jump in the water and I'm like, wow, is this what it feels like? This is great, I'm loving this. And then next thing I know, somebody snatches me out, throws me back up on the dock, and I'm up there gasping for air. So it's not that people, white people don't work hard, because they do. And one of the things that um, really happens is that I think of life as being like a 100 meter race, and poor white people start at zero at the starting line, all the way up to the Rothschilds who start at 97. Those are the people who sold arms during World War II to both sides, to the Axis and the Allies, so they were making theirs no matter who. So people have different levels of privilege that they get to exercise. People of color start back behind that starting line, back to African Americans who are back at minus 50, and you say, why, why African Americans back at minus 50? Well, we're back at minus 50 because we're the most maligned group here in, in the United States. And if you stop and think about it, I mean, think about it. So anyway, and when we're back there, we're blindfolded, one leg tied behind us carrying a piano, and the gun goes off. And we wind up either slightly behind, even, or slightly ahead. And the question is, how do you manage to do that when you've started so far behind? And it's because you know you have to work harder. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and uh, we, will t we will have a wonderful discussion afterwards. Thank you all for coming, and we're really excited that you're here. Welcome again. Hopefully that video begins to give you a sense of how this evening may go. Um, how many of you are here for the very first time? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. This is a little bit of a lighter crowd than we expected. I think it has something to do with some things that are going on that are bigger than us. But if anybody wants to come closer or consolidate tables, please do so. We can hold space for each other and enjoy each other's company this evening. Um, I said that I would tell you a little bit about how the evening is going to go myself. And I want to just tell you one more thing about race talks as we get started here. Donna just gave you a really great introduction there in the video. I just want to reiterate the mission of Race Talks. I think it's beautiful. The mission is to build community through contemporary race-focused conversations within Portland and beyond. This program helps to improve communication and relationships by filling the spaces between races with compassionate education. And through this program, we can co-create the topics and educate each other about race-relevant issues in Portland's past and present. And I'm just really honored that we get to be a part of this. I think, I can't imagine that many other cities have this opportunity, and that's one of the reasons that I'm part of Race Talks. 
So I am one of the Race Talks volunteers. We're a group with diverse experiences, um, race, ethnicities, and um, gender identities. I happen to identify as white, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. I can tell you a little bit more about me. Um, my awareness about the systems of racism that I'm a part of continues to grow daily. And um, one of the things that's also grown for me, I'm over 50, and believe it or not, it was when I was close to 50 that it finally hit me over the head that one of the solutions to issues in our society is actually talking about them. I grew up in a family that didn't talk about stuff. You know, just kind of, how was your day? How was school? What do you want for dinner? All that good stuff. Um, but it was through work with an organization I'm involved in, this, um, its mission is education in the community, that I learned by talking about things, we learn more about how to address issues in our environment, and our systems of oppression, and even our interpersonal relationships. So again, it's an honor to be a part of this group, and I am so pleased that Donna Maxey and Shana Pomerantz uh, run this organization with love for us and our community. So our evening together will have two parts. First, we're gonna hear from our guests about the census, what it is and what it isn't. And during this portion, you'll have a chance to write down questions that you have for our guests. You'll pass those to a facilitator at your table and they'll bring them up to the front and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. The second part of the evening, we'll have an opportunity to talk with each other. And again, this is a real treat opportunity um, a blessing for our community. You'll have a facilitator that will be there to support your conversations with each other, and you'll be part of then filling the spaces between us with compassion. Some housekeeping. The restrooms are located outside of each of these doors. The women's at the back and the men's at the front. Um, I have to admit, that's what this says, and I don't know about gender neutral. Um, choose what you feel comfortable. Choose what you feel comfortable. Thank you, Shana. Um, there's a bar in the back, and serving us tonight are our great McMinniman staff members, Poppy, Mariah, and Ariana. Thank you for being here with us tonight. <laughs> McMinniman's has been a faithful sponsor. Um, they provide us with space, staff, posters, gift certificates, and more. So please enjoy being here, eat and drink to your heart's delight, and tip generously. Um, next, have a little bit more orienting to do. At your tables, you have these baskets. Okay, so I just want to give you a little bit of the orientation of what's in your basket. In here, you're going to find Race Talks brochures. These are for you to take home and share with your family and friends and work coworkers, drinking buddies, anything you want to do. Please spread the word. Um, everyone here is welcome here. Uh, you have pen and paper for note taking. Again, you can use these for your own benefit, taking notes, or you can use them to write questions for the presenters. You've got little slips of paper here, and these are so that you can sort of make business cards for each other. If you want to get to know each other, we're going to have an activity at the end where you can formally do that. You can do it informally throughout the evening. And then also on the table, you have a participant sign-up sheet can sign that, that would be great. There's an opportunity there to get on the mailing list if you'd like. And you have an evaluation sheet. We continue to try to make this program better and better, and we welcome your feedback, your ideas. So please go ahead and write down how the evening goes for you. All right, you'll leave that evaluation at your table, or you'll turn it in at the greeter's table on your way out. And then finally, there's one of these sparkly pouches in the um, basket on your table. As I mentioned, the Race Talks mission is to improve our communication and relationships. So one of the ways that we can support this mission is by financially supporting what's going on here. No one's getting a salary, but it does take some money, even with McMiniman's sponsorship, to make this program happen. So we have multiple ways. Many of you have already given generously when you walked in the door. Thank you very much. Um, in addition, there's an opportunity to buy a t-shirt for $20. Those t-shirts were donated by a family here locally that makes those. Um, you have a chance to buy a raffle ticket for a basket donated by Greenhouse. And so those tickets are $10. Anybody correct me if I'm wrong. 
Um, and you can continue to make a patron's donation. So if you want to put just a little bit more money in here, your facilitator will make sure this gets to race talks and to no one else. Or you can make a donation at the back, and that can be with cash, credit card, or check. Okay. So we really appreciate your commitment, your generosity, and thank you for coming. You are all part of the solution to a better community. Okay, one other thing I want to highlight. Along with the mission of Pace Race Talks, we like to simultaneously promote other organizations whose missions align. And so tonight we want to call out We Count Oregon. Precious Edmonds is going to tell us more about that. But if you are interested in volunteering your time, you can go to the website and see how to volunteer for We Count Oregon. All right. Anybody with race talks that wants to tell me I've forgotten anything, let me know. All right, great. So what we're gonna do now is go to this first part of the evening. So again, we're gonna talk about the census, what it is and what it isn't. And so I'm going to do the initial introduction of um, our presenters, and then they'll each have 20 minutes. Um, so it'll be about a 40 minute presentation, and then we'll do our Q&A, okay? Anything else before I? Transition? Yes, Shannon. How do you want questions submitted? Do you want them all gathered at once, or how do you want to do it? Facilitators can bring them to me any time because I can start to see if they're clustering around ideas. So, throughout or at the end. Okay. Other questions? Great. Okay, so I'd like to turn it over to Precious Edmonds and Charles Reinerson. Precious is from We Count Oregon and Charles is from Portland State University, and they're gonna tell you more about themselves. Good evening, my name is Precious Edmonds, and I'm the Community um, Engagement Coordinator for our We Count Oregon Campaign, which is a PLC statewide-led coordinated campaign. I'm the Community Engagement and Partnerships Coordinator for We Count Oregon Campaign. And I live in Southern Oregon in Ashland with my daughter. Um, so I'm raising a young black lady in Oregon. I've been living here for about two years. I moved here from Atlanta where I went to grad school at Georgia Tech. I am a former educator. I taught high school chemistry for about three years. And my time in education only expounded my knowledge about what disparity looks like in the classroom and I felt like I couldn't address those issues necessarily just from being a teacher in the classroom and so that kind of led that's the reason why I moved out here I was looking for a change but also another way to um, to give back to my community in a way that I felt like was actually more impactful and so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work on the census because I do believe and understand how necessary a complete count is to ensuring that our communities have the resources that they need because I'm raising a child and I don't want her to grow up and have to attend the schools that I was teaching in because they were severely under resourced and I don't want that to be a part of her story as well as I am three, about three to four generations removed from being a descendant of enslaved people. And I also want to make sure that when my children, children's children, um, do their genealogy, that they can see and that they'll be able to look me up and know that I was free. Should I go through yeah, my, okay. Yeah, do you want me to just sit Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's fine. I thought we were gonna just do an introduction. All right, next. All right, so I work for We Count Oregon Campaign, and this is our team. We're led by Esperanza Turvalon Garrett. She is our campaign manager. She is the first black woman to run a C3, C4 pack out of California. We have Perla Alvarez Lucio, who is a, um, She's our field director, so we're gonna launch a field operation that coincides with 
the um, beginning of the census that actually is starting very, very soon, within days. Um, and so she's leading that. And we have Jose, Jose Luis Maldonado, who's the deputy field director. He'll be supporting Perla in her efforts as well as doing our data. Um, we have Mandy Yepa, she's an indigenous woman, um, born and raised in Southern Oregon, and she is our communications director. We also have myself, I'm the community engagement coordinator, and I'm responsible for the training program that we're doing and um, increasing community awareness about the census. And last, but of course not least, we also have C. Autumn Edmo. She is our newest personnel and she's the tribal community coordinator and she's working directly with Indian Country to um, support their efforts in getting counted. Next, please. <coughs> and because our campaign is unique in the fact that it is a community-led effort, we're working with um, several different organizations and each of those organizations have saw fit to hire a full-time person to um, whose entire work is dedicated to the census. And we call those people the census equity coordinators. So this is a picture from all of the census equity coordinators that are working with the We Count Oregon campaign. Um, this is a picture from their training back in October. So the anchoring organizations that we are working with is Apano, Oregon Futures Lab, Oregon Futures Lab, PALF, soon to be called Imagine Black, GALSA, RAICES, CAT, Unite Oregon, East County Rising, Maya Family Center, Latino Network, Forward Together, and Pacoon. So all of these organizations have, they decided um, ultimately to come together and they wanted to work on having the hard to, hard to Count outreach program. And so they've designed the plan. They're also implementing that plan through the hiring of their census equity coordinators. So they are going to be directly in, engaged in um, doing the outreach themselves. And so, Dancing Hearts Consulting, so Esperanza Turbon Garrett, who's the campaign manager, she's the consultant of record. She leads an organization called um, Dancing Hearts Consulting. And, but it's really the work of these organizations that are driving the campaign. And so the We Count Oregon campaign's mission is to ensure that Hearts Count communities that include people of color, immigrants, renters, rural people, Real people living in rural communities, children under the age of five, all know about and take the 2020 census. So, um, <clears throat> and our focus is hard to count, and so we want to make simple the process, and so make sure that our communities understand what the process is, how do they actually get to engage with the census, and ensuring them that it's safe. And so, the things that they need to know is that the census happens once every 10 years, and it is a count of every person living in the United States. And that's irregardless to, or regardless to your um, document, your status in this country. So you do not have to be a citizen to participate. Um, if you live here, you have a right to participate. And it is very important that you participate because it determines how and where those federal dollars are going. Um, so that's how, the census data directs um, federal funding for our communities. And the census has been around for a very, very, very long time, as it is one of the first things that was established in the United States. Um, the very first census, census took place in 1790, and back then, you know, people would ride up on a horse and come and knock on your door, and they would come and interview the person living in the home, and usually they were only talking to white men, right? Um, and, and getting questions about their family, so free white men, free white women, and then the other category was enslaved persons. And so, but that changed in 1870, you know, they recognized, through the census, it was recognized that more than just black and white people are living in America, um, and they identified people of color as either black, Chinese, or American Indian, and obviously Chinese is a very problematic category because not every Asian person living in America was Chinese, but those were the options that were available to you at that time. And then in 1960, it became, um, they started mailing out the forms to your home, but uh, an enumerator still needed to come to your house in order to collect that information, in order to be counted 
And then 1970, the self-enumeration began where they actually mailed out the forms and then you mailed it back. And so that was awesome. So people had to, no one had to necessarily come to your home, particularly if you lived in the metro area. In 1990, electronic data collection methods was introduced. We assumed that that was, you can respond over the telephone. And then 2020, this is the first year that the census is allowing you to respond online. And so that's a very big deal. It's a whole new program that's being rolled out. So we're doing the census a little bit different this year. And so an enumerator, right? Um, when people think of the census, a lot of times people think of someone coming to their house and knocking on their door. In particular, when I'm talking to black people, um, they're like, oh, I'm not doing the census. I don't want the people to come to my house. And one that just tells me the, it's been a while since they've engaged with the census, right? Because the census has been a self-enumeration process for a while now. And also, it just lets me know that they don't know that they are supposed to self-enumerate. So they're supposed to respond, and someone actually coming to your door means that you're not, um, you're outside of that process, and so you're actually in the process called non-response follow-up. And so that has been very illuminating when talking to my own family members, because that's the response that I get, is that they don't want people coming to their doors. Um, and so part of our We Count Oregon is informing people that you don't have to have someone come to your door. It, and it's particularly now, you can do it as easy as responding online. Next. And so some key dates that you need to be aware of, beginning in March, and actually this week, so from March 12th to March 20th, you should expect to receive your first census mailing from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and then they're gonna be doing like a total of five mailings, depending on whether or not you've responded to the census, um, up and through, Mar uh, through April. Um, the census self-response period lasts from March all the way to July 31st. And so April 1st is officially census day, and so everyone is encouraged to reply, to respond by April 1st, but obviously everyone is not gonna do it then, and it's not too late if you miss April 1st deadline or time, um, you have until July 31st to actually respond to the census. Sorry. Oh, you're good. It's fine. And so May begins, well, yeah. So those enumerators that I was talking about earlier, they will actually begin non-response follow-up in May. Um, I think the date was like around May 13th. So we are encouraging our people to respond um, as early as possible in order to not have to need to be in that process of having someone come to your door for non-response follow-up. Next. Um, and then the last one is that on December 31st that they have to provide a report based essentially of all the data to the president. So um, you will receive a census letter in the mail from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, well, most people inviting them to take the census online. And the key thing, piece of information that you need from that is that there is a census ID that is coded to the address. Um, that address, when you go online to the website that they will give you, you will punch in that number and then it will pop populate the address that you're filling out the form for. Um, all of the forms that are being sent out, the Census Bureau doesn't know who lives at each household yet, right? Um, they won't know that information until after you complete your census. And so if you receive a census form at an address, you should use that census form for that, that census ID for the address. There are three ways to respond to the census. Um, the major way and the new way this year is online, but not everyone wants to do it online or not everyone has the internet access to do it online. There's also the option to doing it over the phone, as well as um, mailing in your form, uh, paper form. If you want to do a paper form, though, you have to wait until the Census Bureau actually mails you out a paper form. And so if you are one of those persons, like I said, you're going to get multiple mailings from the U.S. Census, one of those mailings eventually will be a paper form if you wait long enough. The phone number for the hotline, the U.S. Census Bureau's help line, is 1-844-330-2020, and you can call that number to if you just have questions about the process. They answer all the frequently asked questions on, over the phone, 
as well as you can submit answers and you can also receive language assistance. Um, the form is only available in 13 languages, but you can receive support in up to 59 languages. And so there, because of like Oregon's you know, demographics, um, there's three different types of programs. It's called the Internet First program, and so that's people who live, have good internet, or the U.S. Census Bureau has mapped all of this out already, and since all of this information is already going out, but you'll be invited to take the census online. Um, obviously, if you wait, you can get a paper form, and then you can do that way if you choose, choose to do so. However, other locations where they have determined have low, bro low broadband um, or even have lower response rates, they have included them as internet choice. And so initial, initially they will receive an invitation to do it online and they will also receive a paper form so they can choose which one that they prefer. And then if you like living in super remote areas, they have update leave where someone will actually bring a paper form to your household and drop it off there for you to use. And this is a map. Um, all of the areas that are in purple, they are receiving internet first, so that means they're just gonna get a letter that is inviting them to take it online. All of the ones that are in green, they're getting internet choice, so they will receive a paper form initially as well. And then all of the ones in yellow will have hand-delivered packets delivered to their house. One of the big things, or one of the biggest concerns um, particularly for hard to count communities was whether or not there was going to be a citizenship question on the census questionnaire and there is not which we are very grateful um, because it was a concern on whether or not they would participate it was obviously you could still participate even if there was a question on there but based on the questions that are being asked there's no way for the US Census Bureau or the US government in general to know whether or not you are a citizen and so it doesn't matter if you have, you're undocumented in order to um, complete the census form. What is being asked on the census form is who lives there on April 1st? Um, of the people, is the place owned or rented? What's your telephone number? What's your name? And so, and for each person living there, name, sex, <coughs> date of birth, and race and ethnicity. And then you have to identify a central person in the household and the relationship of every other person to that central person in the household. And it is very important um, to include everybody living in the household, um, regardless to the relationship that you have with them. There's no judgment to the relationship that exists. It doesn't matter how many people are living in the household. Um, whether or not they're living there temporarily is most important. The primary thing is to get people counted, right? And so if you have foster children living with you, you should include them on your census form. If, you, if your niece is living with you right now, you should include her on your census form. It doesn't matter the relationship. You know, if your, your friend is living there and, uh, for the next two or three months and they don't know where their, their next home is going to be, they should also be included on your census form. And then Title 13, a big concern for the hard to count communities is safety and what is going to happen to this information. Um, and so Title 13, we can go to the next slide. Title 13 protects their information, their confidentiality. So ultimately, all of the data that is being collected is only for statistical purposes um, and it won't be published for 72 years. And so, um, which is very important, so by the time that information is published you might not be around depending on um, you know and that's the re reality so you don't have to be concerned uh, also many of the questions other than your address and like you physically being the concern about someone being physically able to find you there's not a lot of information that's on the census form but that information is protected by title 13 and all of the U.S. Census Bureau employees are sworn to protect your confidentiality. And um, if they violate, violate that, they can receive up to five years in prison and or a $250,000 fine. So it's a big, big penalty for violating that because they want to encourage 
um, people to fill it out, so they want people to feel secure in knowing that their information is safe. And why does it matter to Oregon, right? Um, it's not just about the census information, but the census data is used for many reasons, and it's very vital to the organs. Um, first and foremost, it is estimated that there are 450,000 more people living in the state of Oregon than there were living in 2010. So there's been a huge influx of people into the state of Oregon, which is great, right? It's good to know that um, the state is thriving, people finding reasons to come live here, but obviously with more people living here, that we need to have the resources to support the, the number of people that are living here. And that happens through the census. Oh. <laughs> I'm so engrossed in it. In addition to um, there being more people with more people, we have the potential for more um, representation. We can potentially gain an additional seat in Congress. And so for um, We Count Oregon, we believe more representation means more power for the people. And so that's a very exciting um, potentiality. Next. And then obviously everyone cares about money. Um, it's estimated that about $3,200 per person per year uh, for every, each person that's identified in the census living in Oregon. So that's what's at stake for the, for the people in Oregon. And, and since the census only happens once every 10 years, that means that this, whatever is determined, whatever funding we're, is determined um, from this census, it won't happen again until 2030. So we won't have an opportunity to make any corrections to that. Next. And so for example, in 2016, Oregon rece received $13 billion in federal funding, um, which made up about a third of the overall state's budget. And that money is going into programs that we that are very useful. It goes to Medicaid, Head Start, roads, schools, hospitals, school lunch programs, unemployment, section, section eight vouchers, programs for seniors, programs for veterans, and that isn't a, even an exhaustive list. So there's tons of other programs that are being that have that receive census directed funding as well. We can see. Yes. Right. So um, the We Count Oregon campaign is focused on reaching hard to count demographics and um, people who are most at risk for being undercounted. And so there is roughly an estimated one million people who fall into one or more of those demographics. So there's a huge population of um, people who are at risk of being undercounted. And of those people, <laughs> we can go to the next slide. 25% 25 25 of the people living in Oregon identify as people of color. So that's a quarter of our population identifies people of color, and people of color are hard to count or at risk for being undercounted. 10% are foreign born, right? Um, foreign born people, they are at risk for being undercounted because they may not know the language or speak English, or they may have come at a time when they don't actually know what the census process is, and because they're new to the United States, they may not understand that they have a right to participate in that process as well. And then children under five. So there are, the population is about 6% is children under five. And children in general are most at risk for being undercounted because at the end of the day, they're completely dependent on someone else putting them on the form, right? They're not actually filling out census forms for themselves. And so parents who, um, or children who live in complicated households or they in shared custody situations or they're in foster care or sometimes these children often go missed from the count essentially because they thought someone else was going to do it or the, the guardian didn't know that they had the right to put them on the form um, because they were only living with them for temporarily so there's a lot of circumstances but it's essential that these children are being counted um, and making sure that we encourage everyone who has children um, living with them to make sure that they're including them. And then renters. Renters are uh, 38, make up 38% of Oregon's population and they are also at risk for being undercounted. And that is essentially it. We have a text account program for We Count Oregon um, that we are encouraging people to get sign up. 
they text the word Oregon to 33339, then they can get um, reminders about what is happening with the census, what is happening with We Count Oregon campaign. Um, and that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Precious. I'm Charles Reinerson, and I work at Portland State University Population Research Center. We've been around uh, being demographic experts in Oregon since 1965, and the work we do, I'm, I'm currently the interim director, and uh, hoping to get a permanent director very soon. But what I usually do is something called the State Data Center Program. So the Census Bureau has a network nationwide in every state of local census data experts. So if you want to find census data in another state and find a local expert, census.gov slash SDC, State Data Center. So Precious covered some, some of what I've got here, so we're going to skip through some of it. But uh, I actually have more than I can present in 20 minutes. So. Okay. Um, my contact information is going to be up here in the last slide, and there's even more slides after the last slide. <laughs> so anybody who wants uh, a copy of this, this presentation, just email me, and uh, I'll send it to you. So stuff we're going to talk about, uh, some of what we've already heard, and then the additional demographic data is great because we're not going to get to it. Uh, history. Uh, it's the actual, enum actual enumeration, this is important. So next, since we're talking about race here, uh, it should be said that also in Article 1, Section 2, uh, just the initial representation of the House of Representatives was based on the number of free persons excluding Indians not taxed and three-fifths of all other persons. So that means slaves were counted as three-fifths. It was a compromise between the, the slave states and the free states. Uh, but it, after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment gave everybody citizenship. And uh, so everybody, the, the congressional apportionment uh, was based on actual everybody living in each state except for Native Americans not not tax but that was cleared up by 1940 so that's uh, took a while next so if you want to know uh, about the census that how race was asked in the in the past there's a couple of really good sites one's on the Census Bureau's website and another one is on a, a site called racebox.org, and they have actual image of the way the question was asked in each census all the way back to 1790. And it has, uh, believe it or not, has changed just about every 10 years, the way that we, we categorize race, as Precious showed you. So the, the census, they kept adding more and more questions to the census until it got pretty unwieldy. By 1940, they realized uh, they're asking too many questions that they don't need just for apportionment. So they went to, the sh maybe you remember, if you've been around a while, the short form and the long form. So the, the short form had the basic questions that we still ask on the census. The long form had questions about things like educational attainment, income, and details of your home. A lot of people think that's what the census is still about, but it's not. Next. Uh, there's that word again, actual enumeration. And sometimes people have said, well, if you know that there's an undercount, why don't we just estimate what that was and we'll use that for apportionment? But the Constitution says actual enumeration. And everybody who's living here, another thing people don't realize is that that uh, non-citizens, even if you're undocumented or a green card holder, if you're living here at the time of the census, you should be counted. So it's good. It's only a few questions. And this is, uh, I think, the most reassuring part to people who are nervous about the census. Because 
the credit reporting agencies know way more about you than what they're going to ask on the census, and they will sell that information to anybody. Your smartphone, your smartphone knows more about you, and all your smartphone and all the apps that you install, they know more about you than the census is going to ask on the census. So it's a, a little ironic uh, for people to really worry too much about the, the questions, these relatively innocuous questions. Next, on the other hand, uh, the uh, American Community Survey, I'm not going to say much about it. This is the only slide about the ACS, but it's a really important survey too that took the place of the long form. And that's where we get all these questions about, about uh, social and economic and housing and uh, em employment, poverty, occupation. So that goes on continuously. And it goes to about 3.5 million addresses randomly every year. How many people have filled out an American Community Survey? Uh, you sure? No. Well, see, it's a small sample. <laughs> Next. So, challenges. There, there definitely are challenges. These are some headlines from just the last few days here on NPR. The first one uh, addressing the internet uh, response. Uh, next one. Fear and disinformation. Apparently, you know, people are posting all kinds of stuff on Facebook, true or not, mostly not. Uh, and finally, this last article from this morning's New York Times wasn't about the census, but this is another threat. You know, once, if you think about it, every other census, since it's done every 10 years, every other one is done in an election year. And this is an election year, 2020. And, uh, Anything that that is intended to to fire people up about the election is is also a threat to the census. So the census did something in 2018 that they call the the C BAMS. It's fun to say C BAMS. Uh, census barriers, attitudes, and motivators study, and uh, they did focus groups and they did a survey and. People were concerned that answers to the census would be used against them. And notice that the chart, all race and Hispanic origin groups were more concerned than whites that the answers to the 2020 census would be used against them. Next. And other, uh, turns out there was a lot of, not a lot of knowledge about what the census is used for. And especially concerning to me, if, if you want to put those circles on the next, next tap, 63% uh, of the people in the focus group thought that the census was to help the police and FBI keep track of people who break the law. That's a concern. And then the next two circles, things that more peop I think more people should know about the census, only 57% said it was true that it, that it determines how many representatives there are in Congress. Only 55% knew that it, it, for sure, that it counted both citizens and non-citizens. So, yes, that there have been uh, uh, breaches of confidentiality in the past. Uh, famously, the 1940 census was used to on the West Coast, identify blocks or neighborhoods where Japanese Americans were likely to be. Um, turns out that in Washington, D.C., they actually gave addresses and names of Japanese Amer Americans. And uh, this, is, this is why uh, the next slide uh, is so important. And Precious talked about Title 13. And you can, this is the Census Bureau's pledge that their data is confidential. Next. There was an event, uh, a uh, interfaith summit where the Census Bureau brought faith leaders together at, at the Bureau, or actually it was at the National Cathedral just a couple, few weeks ago. And 
some people were voicing their concerns. Uh, there was a pastor from Chicago who mentioned that, uh, you know, his community was, was concerned and thought there was a really bold and brilliant statement from a Census Bureau official, Alf Fontenot, uh, who said, you know, himself being African American, said, for decades, black and brown communities in America have been undercounted. And if we allow fear to cause us to be undercounted one more time, we are putting power in the hands of people we do not want to put power in their hands. And yeah, there, there are people who benefit from, uh, from others not responding to the census. And they are not, uh, those people who benefit are generally not people of color. You've, you're familiar with voter suppression? Well, census suppression does pretty much the same thing. And in fact, some states, uh, legislatures and governors have purposely not promoting the census the way that we're doing in Oregon because they, they are looking for an undercount. And uh, that's, that will redraw the, the political map by not counting people. <coughs> Here's the political map. We uh, almost made it to a, get a sixth seat in 2010. Uh, there's a little note here, more click. So we, we just missed getting a seat in 2010. And uh, Texas and Florida got seats. Washington got their 10th seat in Congress in the after the 2010 census. So, so now uh, we are underrepresented by about 100,000 people per congressional district compared with the US average because we had, we're at the high end of five. So next time around, uh, this is the prognostication for, based on the Census Bureau's 2019 estimates, Oregon should get that sixth seat. And so, you know, people want to wonder, like, where is that seat going to go? Well, if there's six seats, each person, each member of Congress should represent about 711,000 people. So next slide shows that all five of our districts are above that threshold. So basically, they're all going to have to shrink. It's up to the state legislature uh, if they can reach agreement. And if they can't, it's up to the Secretary of State to draw those new maps and redraw six districts with equal population. Not only uh, the House of Representatives, but all kinds of local uh, districts, legislatures, school boards, important public schools, board members is on the right, House districts is on the left. You know, there's 60 house seats in Oregon. If there's 4.2 million people, that's about 70,000 people per house district. Uh, if there's 80,000 people in your area and only 70,000 are counted, then your representative is gonna be representing 80,000 people instead of 70,000 people. So, uh, Precious talked about the money. Uh, it's important, so, but we'll, we'll skip over that. Uh, it's actually a new estimate that the same researchers just came up with. It's even more money. <laughs> Fiscal year 2017, 19 billion dollars came to Oregon. Uh, not directly because of census counts, but uh, the, all the estimates are based on the census. So the American Community Survey, if, if once the census is released, those estimates will be recalibrated, annual population estimates, other surveys, next. And it's not just money and political representation. Uh, businesses use this data to decide whether they're gonna locate. Uh, employers, and this is a great example of, of how the census is used as a foundation for other surveys. For example, there, the Census Bureau does uh, a survey on behalf of other federal agencies called the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity File. So 
when businesses are deciding whether they are hiring a representative population, they use this file that says, for example, you know, how many African American men live in this community? You know, are we hiring a, a proportional number of of people in, to work in our firm or our you know, public works project? You know, the EEO file is based on on the decennial census data, and it's used to uh, you know evaluate whether fair hiring practices are, are being invoked. The, they, oh, one more bullet on there. Uh, researchers use the census data to create representative samples. So if you want to uh, make sure that your your survey you drawing a sample, you want to make sure it's proportional to the population, you're going to look at the census. I had an experience with this long ago, early in my career, when uh, Multnomah County Court System hired our office to do a survey of people who were coming in for jury duty. So it was great. It was, the judge said they had to do this survey. It was the best response we ever got. Because people are in the jury room. We, they walked in the door. We handed them the survey, which asked about their race. And that information was used when they switched from, from using uh, voter registration to using driver's licenses to choose jury, juries in Multnomah County because they realized that, uh, of course, at that time, you didn't register to vote when you got a driver's license like you do now. So they realized that the, the juries were not representative. They were too white and too old because those are people who had registered to vote. Uh, so, next. Uh, so, how is the census question on race asked? It's, as Precious mentioned, it's self-reported. They used to go and look at people and write down their race, but now, especially since 1970, it's, uh, it's all self-reported. And the a lot of people think the Census Bureau makes these categories, but it's actually the Office of Management and Budget, and, which is part of the executive branch. So there's a, in 1997, that's when they designed basically the, the minimal race groups that we use now in the census. That's also when they came up with that you could uh, check all the, you know, check more than one race. and. Uh, and that's pretty much what we're stuck with. I'll show you. You'll see, well, back up one. Uh, you know, some people want to say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we were colorblind? And why does the Census Bureau put us in these categories? Well, we're not, as you all know, we're, we're not a colorblind society. And there are lots of federal, these uh, affirmative action, Voting Rights Act, uh, Employment Opportunity, Civil Rights Act, Public Health Service Act, all of these, these acts need this race data that's collected by the census. So next. On the left is the way the questionnaire looked in 2010. And uh, perfect. Uh, we crossed out a couple of things because these are the minor changes that occurred. In 2010, they had a category Black, African American, or Negro because they tested this question and they dis discovered there were a, a tiny number of people who still preferred that term. Uh, apparently those people are not around anymore because they, they crossed out that and it's just black or African American. They also took Guamanian off. But uh, let's uh, highlight over here. The other change that happened is that in 2010, if you were white or black, you were simply just white or black or you know more than one or whatever but this is something and you can think about how you want to define yourself they're now write in boxes for every race so you can write the details of what kind of white you are what kind of black you are uh, just like you can write your American Indian tribe or your your detailed Asian group so so then, once we gather this data, how is it reported? Well, there's lots of different ways that it's reported. 
And these are two examples. Uh, go ahead. The, the upper box, people like to report it this way because it adds up to 100%. So they put everybody who's not Hispanic into this two or more race category. And it looks like a small number, you know, 3% of Oregon's population in 2010. But take a look at the next arrows. So if you, uh, if you report black or African-American alone and not Hispanic, uh, that's about 65,000 in 2010 in Oregon. But if you want to be more inclusive and, and count everybody who checked that black or African-American box, regardless of whether they check something else, it's closer to 100,000. So this varies a lot from state to state. And I like to make the case that, you know, it depend, know what you're using, you know, know your data, use the right table, because if you're trying to develop some kind of rate, like a, uh, a criminology professor wanted to, to develop uh, rates of you know, victimization of crime, well, you know, the police officer isn't handing somebody a, a form with two-part question and check all the reply. He's looking at somebody putting down their race. So you, in this case, you might want to use the more inclusive denominator. Three more ways of, of reporting race. Uh, on the left is only from the, the uh, race part of the race question and not the Hispanic question. So that includes everybody, whether they said they were Hispanic, Latino, or not. And in that case, uh, Oregon was 83.6% white in 2010. On the right-hand side, the bottom right combines those two questions, race and Hispanic origin. And in that case, not white alone, not Hispanic or Latino, 78.5%. So it's like a five percentage point difference. And again, we're here to help you. <laughs> we get questions all the time at my office about you know, how, to, how to interpret the data and uh, you know, which tables to use for, for what purpose. A couple of great websites. Uh, the Census Bureau is on top and the Oregon, uh, Oregon's own website, which is Oregon2020census.gov. And next is we learned about oh, December 30th, December 31st that Precious mentioned, that's when we'll know the total population of each state in the U.S. and we'll know how many seats in Congress. The more detailed data doesn't start rolling out until uh, March at the latest, and that's the redistricting data that has the, the race data at the block level. That's, and that's when people can hit the ground starting to draw redraw districts. And then uh, later in the spring and summer, we'll get even more details. Next. And next. That's it. That's, that's my contact info. So you're welcome to uh, call or email. Okay, thank you, Precious and Charles. That was great. A little trivia. When we were training to be race talks facilitators, Donna Maxey, our leader, had us take some sort of personality test. I don't know exactly what to call it. But uh, we rose to the top as either seeking fun, peace, power, or relationships. I rose to the top as seeking fun, and she looked at me in disbelief because she didn't think I was fun, I guess. I don't know. But um, I just want you to know, as a fellow researcher, I do dig the numbers. I'm like into the numbers, and I think this is fun. So. <laughs> Thank you. My gosh, look at this. Woo, this is awesome. OK, I had like four before this, and I had them organized. Now i got to do more work. Um, I wonder, Donna, would you help me? Because I can do some organizing if you'd ask. Do you feel up for it? I'm smart enough to read, so why don't you organize? Right, and then you'll ask? I'll ask. Okay, great, excellent. Um, okay, so this is the Q&A part of our um, evening, and I think...
this is what's going to happen. Donna's going to introduce herself, because not everybody's met you, please. I'm Donna. <laughs> I'm Donna. Um, while she's while she's organizing these, I, I want to go back to our our, um, our talk that's going to happen in April. So I'm doing a little plug here. We're going to be asking for your help. Um, I think she mentioned that we asked. And I'm sorry, you guys. This, this is what's been on my brain this whole time. But we're going to be. At, we have asked the 15 area school superintendents to participate in a race talks that will be at the crystal ball room. We have enough room there for about 600 people. And if you want to eat, you can go downstairs in the restaurant and they have about 150 people that will hold down there and we'll be live streaming it down there. But um, we've heard back from two of the superintendents saying, yes, I'll come. And the rest of them, and one who said, I, I have a personal engagement and I'll turn it over to my equity person if they're interested, if they can come. So we want y'all to put some pressure on them, okay? Indeed. I think they're asleep. What? I think they're asleep. I think they are. I mean, I, 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 I didn't get my sleep last night. I have an excuse, but let's try that one more time. We need you to put some pressure on the superintendents, okay? Okay. All right, so what we, we will do, what we want you to do is call the superintendent where you live and say, hey, I hear that Race Talks is having a forum in April. I'm looking forward to that forum and hearing what you have to say. What we are asking is for them to share their equity pro plan and their, um, and their, and their um, Shana, what's the name of it? What's the other one? Equity and safety plan. Safety plan. I'm sorry, y'all. I've had three concussions. So sometimes I go blank. So anyway, um, we are wanting to know what's going on. What brought this on is that I was reading about a child who committed suicide, nine years old. And this is the first time, and Charles, you, you would know this with, with, the, um, with all of the counts and everything, this is the first time in the United States that our um, lifespan has gotten shorter because children are committing suicide. The 10 to 24 year old category, there, is, there was a 56% jump in the last less than 10 years of kids committing suicide. And I, I looked at that and I just thought, oh my gosh. And, and it showed where a child's parent was suing the school district, the teacher, the principal, and the school district because they had not, um, they had not responded. And when the mother called and said that she was being, her child was being harassed, well, the little boy said to the little girl, she happened to be African American and he happened to be white, um, you, you just might as well kill yourself. So the next day she committed suicide. And I thought about this and I thought, oh my gosh, this child is dead. But more than her being dead, we now have a nine-year-older that's a killer. And what is happening with that child? How, what's going to happen to him? Is he going to just continue on? Is there going to be no consequence? Are there going to be no services to him and his family? That's really deep when you stop and think about it. So I really hope that you, we're not expecting that everybody has a plan already. I know they don't have a plan. I know a lot of them don't have a plan about um, equity. Most certainly they don't have a plan about safety and violence prevention. But I'd love for us to be starting a conversation so that they can start working together um, you might have seen where in the last couple of weeks, Benson High School had a, um, a noose that was put in the school. Um, that has an effect on people. I know I felt it. My parents are from East Texas. You know, that's one of the highest lynching um, capitals in, in, in the country, uh, traditionally. And so 
you know, when I see that, it just scares me. It, it startles me. And then last week, um, there was a student, there was something that happened in the restroom at Grant High School where there was some, um, some program, somebody wrote in the bathroom that um, black students should be killed. So, but as crazy as kids are these days, it might have been a black kid who wrote it, you know, trying to get the 15 minutes of fame. I don't know. But we need to find out what's going on. There need to be consequences. And so, these kids need help. There are too many children committing suicide. We are the adults. We're in charge. We need your help to make sure that our children survive so that we have a future, so that we take account for a reason. Um, I'm pretty passionate about this. I'm a retired educator. Uh, she should have told me to say nothing. I see I was doing fine when I just said I'm done. Can you but clarify I, why you're saying a black child would have lied about a racist attack? The reason that I mentioned about a child, a, a, a black child lying about this is that we have, the, you know, Andy Warhol said that we have our 15 minutes of fame. Quite frequently, children who are in all white uh, settings are ignored. They are, they are kind of ridiculed for being different. Um, and it's not anything that's not unusual. I, I took a slight survey of, uh, of 10 people and asked them, did you ever get teased or did you get bullied? Uh, of those 10 people, they were age 14 to 100, my mother's 100 years old, and um, they all said, yes, I was teased. Some, one person said I was the bully, and he was bullied by his father. My mother, did she remember who her bully was, who teased her, but she remembered her name, and that she had done something when she, they were adults. I mean, that's profound. That goes into the core of who we are. So we've got to do something about this. We've got to, we've got to solve this problem. And right now, one of the reasons about this whole thing, thinking about this, and why I started Race Talks, is the browning of America. I'm sure you've all heard about it, right? that there's the, the, um, the thought that by 2040 there's supposed to be more people of color than there are white people in the United States. We have to start talking to each other. We have to have a relationship. And we're all responsible for this. There's so much going on in this country and, and we're seeing every day that people are stepping up and saying negative things. That is not okay. That is not okay. Everyone has a right to live, and everyone is beautiful. I'm looking out here at this audience. We have a great mix of people in this audience. Some of us have blonde hair. I see my sister back there with the orange shirt on that has blonde hair like me. She doesn't know she has blonde hair. You, oh, oh, is that hair white? I thought it was blonde. Anyway, that was a joke, y'all. That was a joke. I'm not going to use my jokes on you anymore. So we're ready. Okay, well, hey, I did. You bought me time. Okay, you ready? Okay, yeah, right here. Okay. So, Don, so I want you to call and tell them you're looking for them to do this, okay? Everybody got that? Yes. Okay, don't make me call your house. <laughs> Okay, Donna and Shana, time-wise, we, thank you everyone. This is amazing. We have a lot of questions. So do we want to use the time for X number of questions and then conversation? I just want to take a hand raise in the room. So folks who want to engage with the Q&A or, or, or spend, generally we give you about an hour, 50 minutes at your tables to have um, table talk. So it's really at the discretion of the table. So all those in favor who want to engage in the Q&A questions. Well, we um, should definitely do some. So we could do 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but we could cut off the questions. So 15 minutes, hands up. 15 minutes of the Q&A? 20 Don't minutes? 20, 20 minutes. minutes? Okay, so new count. 20 minutes Q&A? Okay. Okay, and let's, then let's start 30 there. minutes Q&A? Golly, this is like... Yeah, there's a lot of good now. questions here. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's do a check-in. Yeah, I'll check we'll in. See how, we'll see the and you'll help me keep questions. time because you saw that I get engrossed in what's going on. Um, Okay, so now tech check. We're gonna give Poppy a second to come on up and see if we can maybe um, allow 
allow you all to use the sitting mic. Um, and also, uh, if you want to bring that mic closer to you. And then I'll put it on for 20 yeah. minutes. Thanks, Donna. Yeah, so OK, you your questions are awesome. I'm going to, um, there were some that were very, very similar. So I'm clustering them. If you don't hear your exact wording, I'm hoping I'm catching some of the spirit of the questions that you've shared. Um, and I would be asking them of both Precious and Charles, either of you could answer or both of you. And if you felt like this was a question that you were really wanting to have answered and I didn't quite capture it, feel free to raise your hand, holler. We're a small group tonight, so let's make this happen together. Precious, we have to talk later because I went to graduate school at Georgia Tech. <laughs> I can't wait to find out what pro program you're in. <laughs> okay. Is it working, Poppy? Is it working? You well, have to get close. They told me you have to be like a rock star. Okay. It's working. Okay. Okay. So either of you, however you want to do it, um, yeah, just leave it off there because it'll go faster. You can, we'll have to hand sanitize later. <laughs> okay, so here's just kind of a general question to get us warmed up. What percent of total Oregon population does the one million at risk for undercounting represent? So what percent of Oregon population is one million? It's a math question. Well, we're at about 4.2 million, so that's a little less than a quarter. But that's a big number. That's a big number. Okay. All right. So there were a few questions around this. Obviously, some um, people are co-parenting or guardians. So for kids who split their times between guardians and parents, how should they be counted? One, well, a couple things. If they're wherever they're going to be living on April first. So the person who has them on April 1st, we're encouraging them to include them on the census form. But also just in terms of like parenting, it can be a conversation. Like you guys can have a conversation about who actually is going to do it to make sure that someone's going to do it. So if you have the type of relationship with the co-parent where you guys are in communication, um, we would encourage to have a conversation about it. Okay. So then kind of this one comes to mind. Do you have to give the names of everyone in the home? What happens if you don't? Um, we encourage you to include everyone that is living in the home, right? No one has, no one will know that everyone isn't included. I mean, they can project based on estimates of population estimates that have occurred on who's actually missing from the number of population that actually is on the census forms that, that what was it, actual enumeration data. Um, but no one will know, but you're taking away resources from your communities when you don't include everyone on the census form. And you might think just the number is good enough, but uh, I think they ask the, the names in part so they don't double count people. You know, kind of, if there's a risk of, of somebody being counted twice, they can try to sort that out. Okay, so here's a related question. Can any name be used? What is the problem if you use a preferred name or a nickname, or what if you've changed your gender or your preferred gender pronouns? Can you use a non-legal name? The Census Bureau man over there is saying, yes, you can use your preferred name. Um, so you should use however you identify is the suggestion on the census form, yeah. I was slow to realize we had a U.S. Census Bureau plant over there. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Um, do you know the history of the term Hispanic and its addition to the census? Yeah. Uh, back in 1970, they added a question of uh, Spanish origin, I believe it was called, but it was only on the long form because they had added it too late to be included in the short form. So that uh, that became Hispanic or Latino because 
you know, people from different parts of Latin America prefer different terms. You know, here in the West, where the, there are more Mexican Americans, Latino is is more frequently preferred. Uh, maybe in the East, where there's a lot of Caribbean folks, they, they like Hispanic. But it, again, they try to be inclusive by having all the categories. One interesting thing about that is that in 1980, maybe 90, they the race question was first, and then the Hispanic Latino question. And that confused people, especially for people from Mexico, where they haven't asked about race on the census since 1921. So they, people didn't see themselves in that race question, so they put other. And then they switched the questions by 1990, I think, so the, the race were definitely by 2000, so that Hispanic came first, people could, sit, could indicate Hispanic or Latino, and then they could choose, they could still choose other, but they could say they were white or Asian or black if they felt like, you know, a, a race would, would be part of their identity. Can I ask a follow-up question? So, <clears throat> knowing that there's Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Afro-Latino, um, when you see the term Hispanic, when I speak to folks who identify as Latino or Latinx or Afro-Latino, they don't consider themselves Hispanic specifically because of the origins to Spain and not South America or the Caribbean. So how are they identifying themselves on the census or, or expected? And maybe I missed that, but I was hearing more Hispanic. Than I'm just going to repeat the question is all. Yeah. So I'm going to do my best. Um, but Shana was asking, some people who might identify as um, Afro-Latino, um, Latinx, Latino, Latina, um, might not identify with the word Hispanic. All right, so how are we seeing their participation in the spent census? Well, uh, the Census Bureau is kind of slow to adopt new terminology, <laughs> and partly because they have to study it for years and then they have to approve the questions like two or three years in advance. But uh, you no, know, the, the hope is by having Hispanic or Latino on the question that covers most bases, and maybe in 2030 we'll see some other words on the census. It sounds like there's some experimentation evolution through your interim surveys too, correct? Like you, um, So there were quite a few questions. I know in our community we have, our hearts are with people who are living with house, without houses. So how are people living without permanent homes counted? Not only those that um, might be in a houseless situation, but also those that are in temporary situations for example, hospitals, incarcerated, other kinds of institutions. There's a, quite a variety there, but these questions are concerned with making sure people get counted. Um, <clears throat> if they are in temporary uh, locations, like in prison or hospitals or um, other type of institutions, those institutions are counted during a process that is called group enumeration, group quarters enumeration. And so the administrators from them are working with the U.S. Census Bureau to determine exactly in which, which way that they would be counted. And then what about people that don't have a house and aren't in an institution? So um, my understanding is for the houseless that there will be like a, there's some days that are dedicated where they will set out um, enumerators to count people where they're located or most likely located to be thought to be living. Um, and then, in addition to that, they also, uh, the houseless can also submit an online form. So if they are missed during that time, they can submit an online form. You can submit an online form without having an address. An address. Yes, is there a follow-up? Yeah, I was curious, what about um, uh, folks who are in detention centers? Do they also get counted? Um, what about folks who are in detention centers? Do they also get counted? Yes. Okay. Yes. They'll be counted during group quarters enumeration. Okay. Yes. Um, my follow-up question is towards the houseless community having um, the option to do online um, self um, 
thing, but if they do not have access to that, then what is like the mechanism or providing for that or is there? So is there a mechanism for people living without houses beyond the, um, beyond the group enumeration and the um, online form? So I know through We Count Oregon, we're encouraging, um, we have census assistance centers. So, and we're encouraging organizations that are working with the houseless population to, um, if they have computers available, to when people come in to get services, to also invite them to take the census during that time. And they don't have addresses, they can literally not just not fill in an address since it's attached, you have your number that's attached to your address? Yes, so the houseless is likely not to have a census ID number, so um, on the online form you can follow prompts. It'll first ask you, do you have a census ID? If you don't have a census ID, you'll click that you don't have one, and there's a series of questions that'll lead you to that they don't have an address, and then we we'll just follow those prompts. Okay. So this is kind of coming up. Um, there's a couple of questions here about people that are working with, um, well, one person words it as, for those who are easily counted or not at risk of not being counted, how can they be supportive for those who are at risk of not being counted? And then another person specifically asks, for those of us living or working with families who are not documented, how can we help? So basically, people are wondering how they can help the process. Um, so a part of We Count Oregon is we believe that um, trusted messengers um, deliver the best message. And so if you are working with, if you are not hard to count yourself or fall into a demographic that is not considered to be hard to count, um, but you work with or you live near or you know personally, so we're encouraging you to talk about the census and um, in ways that people are relatable because people, if you know people personally, they're more likely to trust what you're talking about and listen to you. And for hard to count communities, the more times that they hear about the census, the more engagement around the topic in a personal way is actually more effective. And so talk about the census as much as possible. I know it's not like the coolest topic necessarily, but um, it is very, it's very helpful, right? So like even within my own family, I've been talking with my family about the census, I'm talking to my sister, I'm talking to my mom, I'm talking, you know, telling them, and then it's, it's interesting just to see the level of engagement, to see, talk about what their concerns are, right? Um, I think oftentimes communities that we're talking about that are hard to count, they're not often listened to. And so um, part of that is to engage in the conversation and do some listening, and then speak to your hopes for the census. And so um, to move them from a place of fear to help. Okay, I believe the interim survey is the ACS. Is that right? Do I have the acronym right? Uh, well, interim, no, okay. it's continuous. Oh, basically. continuous. It, okay. Yeah, it, it, we get new data from it every year. Okay, so the question is, is the data in the ACS as protected, confidential, secure as the data in the census? Yes, it's protected under Title 13 also. Okay. Um, here's a couple that are specific about our state. So there's three questions here. I'm going to try to organize these, but um, one question is, how does the Oregon Constitution, how is it different or similar to the U.S. Constitution when it comes to a census? Uh-oh, I see a smile. What? <laughs> Is this like trivia night at the bar? I don't know. <laughs> Does anybody know? I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's anything in the Oregon Constitution about the census. I know there's, in the Oregon Revised Statutes, there's a requirement that our, our office at Portland State do population estimates every year. And of course, the, the census every 10 years is the baseline for those estimates. So this one's about the state of Oregon's responsibility and role as a government entity in helping to get this data. So one question asks, how would you rate the quality and support the government entities within Oregon give to the census count? 
Well, maybe this is one for both of us to weigh in on. But uh, you know, we're very fortunate that, that the state of Oregon put money together to, to hire uh, Dancing Hearts and promote the census with We Count Oregon. Very fortunate too, they, the governor's office has hired a, a full-time census coordinator, Aldo Solano, and he's doing a great job. About half the states in the US did put that kind of money together, and about half the states didn't. It's really interesting to see which ones did and didn't. California is making a huge effort. What is it, like 180, 187 million? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, they, they're at risk of losing a seat in Congress because they're not growing as fast as the nation for the first time ever. So, you know, on the other hand, Texas didn't put any state money into promoting the census. <laughs> so that was kind of another one of these questions. It sounds like our state is behind this. There were questions about like, why would a state not be behind this? And it sounds like some states aren't. Why would that be? If there's money involved and a responsibility, why wouldn't states make this happen? Yeah, yeah. If uh, you know the, the people who are hard to count, or maybe the people who won't be as well represented, then maybe that's going to benefit some people. Charles, can you uh, or Precious explain gerrymandering, just so we all have a working understanding of the term and how it applies to voting? Well, the the team that's in power, uh, as you recall, the midterm elections uh, in Obama's first term, 2010, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, change in, in house, uh, state house legislatures. And so uh, whoever's in power at the time that the census data rolls out the year after the census, in most states, it, they get to draw the boundaries. So I, there's some states now that have like nonpartisan commissions doing it. But if you can draw the boundaries, you, now with you know computerized mapping and all the data that's available, you could quickly figure out you know which which kind of boundary is going to benefit your your party. And there's there's a uh, packing and and forgot the other term, but basically cracking and packing. That's it. You can, if you put all of your opponents if, into one district, suppose you put all of your, you can draw a district that's just overwhelmingly full of your opponents. You could draw it's a district. Like black people. Yeah, or whoever is, is, is not in power. You, you, you put them all in one district, like uh, especially because people are sort of sorting themselves, especially urban and rural, right? If you have a city that's overwhelmingly uh, in, in one political party, you could make that, there. sure, you, they can have that seat. We're going to give out ourselves a majority, you know, maybe 55, 60% in all these other seats, so that they're packing everybody into, into that seat. And that's, that's gerrymandering. And, and it's especially gerrymandering when it's a really weird looking <laughs> boundary, right? And then it's really obvious, and that's what happened in North Carolina. Yes. Yeah, as, as you said, gerrymandering is illegal. Uh, there are guidelines on setting up gerrymandering of strong districts in there. And as Charles said, in North Carolina, we're still redrawing their 2010 census redistricting lines because they kept going in courts and being challenged and thrown out up until last year. Uh, they were still redrawing the lines. It, it is a process. And as Charles says, sometimes you have a little squiggly line that has to be contiguous. You can't skip. You can't. There are a lot of rules into it, so you can't just like just say, "I'm going to do this." There are, there are guidelines in with it that makes it, and then you have the courts to look at that. The Census Bureau is not involved with that. We provide the data, and that's all we do. So <laughs> we don't make the decision on how the congressionals are made up at the city, the county, the state, or anything. We just provide the data that's used for that. I'm sure everybody understands that. We are not the drawers of that at all. 
in, in the Supreme Court has ruled that you, you can't uh, gerrymander for racial purposes, but you can, they said it was okay to gerrymander for political party purposes. Okay, so this may be a similar kind of idea. Um, it seems as though we're promoting a lot of the benefits of the census, and we're also um, thinking about how people self-identify. But there's a certain boxing to the self-identifying. Okay. So when is this self-identifying helpful, and when is it really just perpetuating artificial boxes and boundaries between people and probably a lot of other things? There's some things here around identity politics. Okay, so our time just ran oh. out, so answer, answer that one, and then, then we'll check with the audience to see if they want to do more questions and answers or go into the discussion. Well, that's a tough one, and you know, that's a, as I mentioned before, it's up to the Office of Management and Budget. You know, we have to ask these questions to enforce the, the various uh, acts, but at the same time, you know, they're fluid and they change, and our ideas about race keep changing. So it's an evolution. And I'll, I'll answer as a black woman and my thoughts on like identity politics, I guess. Um, personally, I don't see anything wrong with checking a box. Like I'm proud to be black and I, I like to know where my community is and where I can go to find my people. So personally, I think Relationships between communities, absolutely, I think those should be improved, but I don't think it's the identifying that is the problem. Okay, we can, uh, Jim's, <laughs> thank you, Jim. Um, so I have four more questions, we could do those, or we could transition to table talks. How do people feel about four more questions? How do people feel about table talks? Okay. We'll just do these questions that, and then we'll that transition. That means that you only have uh, about 25 minutes at your table to talk. After we do these? After, yeah, because we because it's 8.25 and we stop at 9 o'clock. Okay, I'll make so it let's three questions. Again, now that you know the time. Okay, who wants to do, like, well, what time would be 30 minutes, Donna? How many minutes is that, five? Uh, three, what do you mean? Like, if we do five more minutes, would that give us 30 minutes to talk? Yeah. Five more minutes on questions? Plus the drawing. Plus the drawing, <laughs> yeah. Plus the drawing and the raffle. Oh my gosh. Okay, so really quickly, I think I can consolidate a couple of these because they're related to the identity politics and you're already kind of digging into this a little bit. So um, when do write and race categories actually, what's the threshold, they actually become just check boxes? And um, I think this other question is, um, if I want to identify how I am black or white, will it matter if I count as if I'm from a German or a French ancestry and representation for the many acts reliant on the census data? Like, it's, I guess, intersectionality, can I use that word? Does the census data, census data handle that? Yeah, well, for the redistricting data that comes out first, they don't have all that detail. So we, we at the block level, all we'll have is the broad race groups, uh, like I showed you on that first slide. But the other data, if you write in something, you know, there, there are tables deep in the obscurity of the census, uh, probably at the state level, maybe, maybe at the county level. I don't know what this uh, write-in of black and white is going to look like. It might be unusable uh, because there would be so many different responses. But people have been asking for this, you know, communities have been asking for it because, you know, how do we know about the Afro-Caribbean population? How do we know about African immigrants? How do we know about Slavic uh, folks? Uh, you know, so it's, it's a step in the right direction. Some people who design surveys just say that you should just have one write-in box. You write whatever you want in there. but. That, that might be a problem for the way that federal government is set up all enforcing all these, these things. Um, I guess I would say 
I don't really know in terms of the on the level of like how the information is used per se. Um, the usefulness of having all the boxes and being able to identify in the various ways. But I do think in terms of like um, historical perspective and just having an account of who's living there. And then in the future, um, when the, your data is 72 years later, when someone wants to go research their great great grandma, they can have that type of information available to them about um, the origins of their history, of their family. So I think that can be very useful data. Okay. So I am going to just ask one more question. And so if I didn't ask your question, I apologize, but I, my sense is these two are absolutely. So feel free to come up to them uh, at any point after this. But this last question is, um, since the census gave up the Japanese in the 40s, and they were um, isolated in camps, um, and currently groups are being pursued by ICE, can anonymous be used? Will census workers guess at who is there? Um, I don't believe that you can use anonymous. I do believe that you need to have your name um, because they need enough information to verify that you're only entering one data, you're only becoming one data point in the data set. So um, you have to at least give your name and your birth date, I believe, um, in order for it to be counted in the census. And anytime that there are questions, there's follow-up. So if you don't want someone to like, have to call you to ask you about what you put on your census form or if you don't want someone to have to come to your door about what you put on your census form. Um, the best procedure is if you're going to complete it to do it correctly. And if they can never find anybody going to the door and they know somebody <laughs> lives there, they may ask your neighbor something bare minimum like how many people live there and they may have to do they may have to impute their, your characteristics. You know, if you live in a, in, a, in a block that's all white, maybe you're white too. So. No, I'm not. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, imputation. That's, that's uh, the last resort. Okay, round of applause for these two. So and for you too, this is a great question. the first part of the evening, so <laughs> this is Donna's point, we want to get to the second part. And we hope that you, um, you may have some questions, but we hope you'll join us at some tables, Charles and Precious. So this is the part where we get to talk to each other and support each other in conversation. Um, we would like everyone to stay, please. If at any point you have to leave, please just give us your feedback on the evaluation and leave it at the back table. We really welcome your input and your reflections on this evening, and it's been great to have you here. Um, so first, I would like the Race Talks facilitators to please stand. Okay, excellent, an awesome group, yeah, you can round the clock. They are all trained by Donna and Shana and our others. So these people are here to support our conversations, your conversations with each other, really. Um, they'll help you go through your ground rules. If you are someone who identifies as a person of color and you would prefer to have a facilitator who you also identify as a person of color, you may move to that person's table for the group discussions. And if it looks like there's not room, don't worry, we'll make room for you. That's just an option if that feels like something you'd like to do. Um, if anybody was sitting on the sides, we want to invite you to please come to a table. We'd love to have you participate. If anyone is sitting at a table without a facilitator, tonight of all nights, please come on and get with a facilitator. Um, and if you came with someone tonight that you know, we do encourage you to sit at different tables so you can take away different experiences to talk about later. It will enrich that for both of you. Okay. So we are going to have our conversations. The facilitators will get you started. And I'll give you a five minute notice when we need to start wrapping up that conversation. They have 28 minutes, Don is telling me. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right, I was sharing with um, Shana that concerns about the administration is correct and that there are laws on the book that says that you can be penalized if you don't participate. However, the We Count Oregon campaign, that is not messaging that we are uplifting. Um, one, because we don't think that punitive 
is not the way to go. We want to think of it as power, that participating in the census is, a, is an exercise of your own power. And it's an opportunity for you to say that you're here to change the narrative about where you're living. And so that is the message that we're communicating, to, um, particularly to hard to count communities, right? Um, so we can't make promises on behalf of the, the administration. We don't work for the administration. We don't know, you know, we have our own questions about the administration ourselves, but that's irrelevant, right? At the end of the day, a lot of the concerns about, that are in the community that are happening, what we fear is already happening, right? So it's like, it's a valid concern, and because you're already living in the space of, you know what it means to have be under-resourced, you know what it means to not have, you know what it means to have black, um, and they use census data to justify some of the reasons why you, your, your communities are under-resourced, right? And so, what, what would it look like if you, you take that power away from them? That they can't say that you're under-resourced because you didn't participate in the census. Because you did, and your communities did, in an overwhelming numbers, in a way that we haven't done before. So for us, this campaign is a tool about building power for our communities, and so that's how we are looking at the census. Do you have anything to add, Charles? No, All right. Oh, Stephen has a question? Yes, I, I do that. That's real. And I just heard you say that it's in the Constitution that there will be punishment or there can be punishment. So my question is, knowing that your campaign does not push that, yeah, if it's the current climate says that that's what's going to happen, what are those things that could and would happen if you decided not to do it? Now that is still a, you know what I'm saying? So you can tell people, you know, I guess this is power, you need to do it, but also the administration that can be saying you don't have to do any consequences, I think the consequences should be saved. You don't get to talk to me about having long ass questions anymore. <laughs> I, think the, I think the consequence is going to be on the form when it comes to you. It'll say something like, you know, under penalty, blah, 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 this, this fine, and et cetera. So they do state it. Uh, just hopefully they don't enforce it. For the record, the Census Bureau is not an enforcement agency. It is not our job to be going after people who don't respond. Can you imagine how the media and everybody on social media would have if we started going after people who didn't respond to the census? There'd be a lot of people in jail. Uh, if you just started looking at that because people like, just because you're doing it, I'm not doing it. We believe, as Precious said, to encourage people to participate in what it means your community is doing with it. Yes, the form will state that. Yes, it will have a statement on there. But it is not the policy of the Census Bureau because we're not a law enforcement agency. So that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to count everybody. Okay, so we just want you to know that even though it's there, we figure that it's nicer and better to talk with you about the advantages of it instead of going after chasing you and threatening you. And believe it or not, this is my fourth census, and I've had people actually, I started out with two, and I've had people that actually mailed me a check to my office with the penalty on it for not participating and says, I'm not doing the census, here's my check. Wow. Okay, so I'm, I'm telling you, and I just looked at it, laughed, and turned it over to our finance people, and they had to send it to Treasury and all that, and, and, and no one ever went after those people for not doing it. So I do know that has happened in the past with the available blank form back with the check on it. <laughs> so we just want you to say that while there, don't concentrate on that, concentrate on the benefits of why it's important to do the census. So what I heard was don't give more money to the private prisons um, and don't give this administration any additional power to use its punitive authority or executive authority to come after folks for doing their constitutional right. That, that's what I'm hearing. Um, Stephen, I think I saw your hand up one more time. No, okay. So this is an act of protest, if you wanna look at it in some ways. In other ways, it's an act of your constitutional right, like voting. Um, in other ways, it could be considered burdensome, but if you see the value in this, please work to consider 
advocating for this process and um, sharing the accurate information about it. Thank you. Enjoy your table talk. Invite you to make a contribution to Race Talks for through this raffle. Um, I did mention that the money goes to, in part, things like the space that is used as an office, it goes to office supplies, it goes to training facilitators, but I forgot to mention that another thing Race Talks is doing is a scholarship fund for youth. And so contributing through this raffle is an opportunity to give to this scholarship fund. The goal is to have $5,000 we are right now at about three. And this fund would go to youth who apply with their goal of how they would like to use $200. And then there will be an application and review process, and the hope is to support youth in our community to achieve their goals. So if you would like to buy a raffle ticket, AJ can take cash, check, and credit. And they are $10. You can buy as many as you would like. And this bag here from Greenhouse is what the winner will receive. She's much too nice. Stand up, Hobbs. Hobbs is what is our youngest facilitator. He just turned 13. Hobbs is a ballet dancer. Um, he um, also is an artist. And um, he's trying to go back. To, where are you trying to go, kid? First, it's... Uh... Denver for the Cleo Parker Robinson Dance Ensemble Summer Intensive. Then I traveled to New York for the uh, Harlem Dance Dance to Harlem Summer Intensive. And then either prior to that or post that experience, I'll be going to Norway for a company residency. All right, with kids trying to go to Denver <laughs> for the Dance Theater of Harlem and to Norway or Finland. And not only that, when he went back just a few months ago, they they said words like Juilliard. The boy is gifted, okay? Pull some money out of your pocket. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we want to thank everyone for participating this evening. So as you're wrapping up and before you leave, part of what we'd like to do is, I see some of you already reflecting on the evening and giving us feedback through evaluations. Please be sure to do that. And if you can ask your facilitator their name, they are. You all are listening, right? No, you know, people back there talking. Donna, did you want to come up and do this? No, no. <laughs> I want you to get their attention and make them listen to you. That's okay. I know they're on task. Okay, so I know you're doing your evaluations. We talked about the raffles. You can buy t-shirts and you can make contributions. So we're going to have our raffle drawing soon, but we have another opportunity for a raffle drawing. So this is where Donna's saying pay attention because Joe Mike, Joe, is uh, um, going to help me demonstrate. We have these little blank business cards. One of the things that we like to do to promote new relationships with people with similar interests is to have you think about if you'd like to switch your name and email with somebody or phone number, whatever you'd like, and get together later and keep the conversation going. Maybe help each other make new connections with people who also are interested in learning more about issues of race in our neighborhoods. So, the what you do, and I don't, you, Mike and I, or I mean Joe and I have never done this, but we each write our name on one. And I write my name on this one as and, well. And my email. And my email. And phone number. And phone number, Donna's saying. And phone number. And, and, then, we and then we trade. And then we can call each other whether we win, win the raffle or not. And we can go to lunch. And actually, I was facilitating a table recently, and a couple told me they keep in touch with a couple they met four years ago at Race Talks. They get together regularly, and they met this way, exchanging their information. So then what you have to do, though, is you take a third one, and you put both of your names. So we would put Joe and Marcy on the third one, and that one goes into the raffle, because if Joe and Marcy or your names are chosen, you get to win the gift card to pay for the lunch that you're going to go for together. So it's a McMinimins gift card, $25. And so we would encourage you to switch and then put two people's names on one piece of paper and we'll put that into the raffle. And who picks up that? AJ's gonna help. Okay, so you'll give this to AJ. She'll know the difference between this and the other raffle ticket. Any questions on that? Thank you, Joe. Yep. 
Once you've had about three minutes to do those things, we're going to have our drawings. Just put in a plug again for our next race talks, April, Tuesday, April 14th. It's always the second Tuesday of the month. It's going to be on equity and student safety progress reports from the Portland Metro Area School Districts at the McMinniman's Crystal Ballroom on West Burnside. Doors open at 6, program starts at 7, room for 650. So bring your friends, please. We'd love to see you. Any other raffle tickets here? Because AJ is going to draw and announce the winner. Okay, drum roll. If you bought a raffle ticket for the gift bag, here you go. If I won, it's because I, I did buy a lot of tickets. Did you? I did. I bought a lot of tickets. <laughs> oh, oh there was there. a lot of crowd. Wait a minute. Um, real quick, real quick, I'm going to talk about uh, we are having a race talks fundraiser that's going to be different than a regular forum on May 4th at Portland Center Stage at 7 p.m. Might be a little earlier. Um, those details aren't quite finished being de uh, worked out, but we will put it on the website, we'll be on face uh, Facebook, social media, uh, it'll also be, you'll be able to buy the tickets from Portland Center Stage on their website, hopefully by next week. We will definitely have information for you to help pass the word out at our next talk, um, but keep an eye out for that information, and if you want to get involved and help volunteer, come find me. Should I feel guilty or like a jerk for winning that? No. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, AJ's going to draw now for the gift certificate for the people going to lunch. Wait, there's more? We got it? We got it, everybody? Okay. I'm not looking. Susie and Annabelle. Okay, so if anybody does happen to go to lunch together and they want to take their picture with a Race Talks brochure, please do that and then you can share that via social media. You have been an awesome um, group tonight. We really appreciate you participating. Thank you for coming out. It looks like it's going to be an interesting few months ahead. And uh, we hope to see you in April and in May. So thank you, everyone.